everybody welcome back um, we're here in room 1b and we're going to be covering sorry 2b we're going to be covering community solutions this afternoon um, first up we've got solarize the kenai solar energy grants for local food businesses with caitlin bodla i said that right and tim um, so i am with heidi rader with the University of Alaska Cooperative Extension. I'm gonna be the moderator. So if you would like to um, share any questions in chat, I'll bring that to their attention at a good moment. And um, other than that, we'll go ahead and get started. Thanks. Thank you, Heidi. And thank you, Robbie, and everyone who is helping put on this conference. It is very impressive. And I know it's like herding cats and magic and a lot of hard work. We're really grateful to be here. And thanks everyone who's on this session. Thank you for your attention. This is a quick half hour session. So it'll be like down and dirty um, or quick and fabulous. Okay, um, I am Caitlin Badla. I'm the regional director for Cook and the Keepers Community Action Studio. And we're in the action studio in Soldatna. And I am joined by my I feel like we should just be family. We're definitely in the same bubble, which is why we're not wearing masks right now. We've been, um, anyways, and this is Tim Johnson, who is our incredible volunteer here at the studio. And he is also the project coordinator for Solarize and has been for the last year and a half. Year and a half. Yeah. So thank you, Tim. Yeah. Let me go to the next slide. And if you don't mind right now, and I'm not gonna see the chat, while we're doing the presentation side of this. So Heidi, if anything fabulous comes up, please feel free to interrupt me. But in the chat, would you please, please state if you know whose lands, whose indigenous lands you're zooming in from. We are zooming in from Seldatnu, which is the Denina spelling for Soldatna. And one of our elders here, Helen Dick, always laughs and said, oh, the white people just spelled it wrong. Um, which is my favorite way to think about Saldatna. Saldatna means trickles down creek, and it is the creek in the heart of our town. And there are um, all five species of baby salmon, oh, not pinks, um, but kings and silvers and, and um, reds all spawn in this creek that our town is named after. So that's where we're zooming in from. Um, and please also drop in the chat uh, what you hope to get out of this session. And I will be peeking at that so we can tailor the session to your needs. Um, quickly, we're gonna give a presentation about our local solution series, which uh, resulted in Solarize and other projects. And we're gonna talk a little bit about an action kit that hopefully could be a good resource for some of you to use in your communities to create local solutions like Solarize or like food-based solutions. And um, we're gonna talk a little bit about our success with Solarize. And then Tim is going to review the opportunities available with the REAP grant. Um, and what we really wanna focus on is a conversation um, where we ask you questions about how we can be helpful. So, ooh, goodness, so excited. So for us in 2019, we started a local solution series at Inlet Keeper. We used Drawdown, has a bunch of solutions in it. We brainstormed them with our community around different topics, um, energy, food, transportation, the food one was the best by far. There was like a big potluck pre-pandemic, it was fabulous. And we tapped into our community's brain power and generated a lot of solutions that were pertinent to our local area. And it was really cool. It was a lot of folks in the same room, some red, some blue, some all different persuasions. And they really came together around common ground to make positive change in their community around like real tangible solutions. 
this was sort of how it worked. And I just wanted to show this with you to explain like where we're coming from and how we got here. Um, it was a way to kind of reframe the hopelessness with all of the bad things that are happening in our world and, and to reframe it in an empowering way that we can do meaningful actions together. Uh, we had a steering committee and discussions, food, energy. We researched a lot of the solutions. We voted on the best one. And then we, we started implementing it. And that was a year ago. We implemented a compost solution. And then we also implemented, over the past two years, a um, solarized solution. I did, I'm going to. You can watch that later if you want to on our website, but I'm, I won't bore you with it now. Um, we really wanted to do solutions that um, could be done in a year and could be done with volunteer effort. Um, so we're here to help make solutions happen. And we created an action kit about how to get stuff done like this in your, in your community. Um, I, this is a softball pitch to anyone who's interested in using this resource. I would love to help stir the pot in your community to make good things happen. And we do have some micro grants available to get projects off the ground and I'm available to be a resource. This is kind of what it looks like. It's really pretty. There's videos. Um, and really it's about reframing the problems in our society, like climate change, uh, gathering our community together, choosing solutions and then acting on it. Um, I did want to share this video with you. It's just one minute long. Can everyone hear? Hi, I'm Heidi Che, a community volunteer from Kenai, Alaska, working with Cook Inlet Keeper and my neighbors on local climate solutions. In 2020, our Solarize campaign brought 500 kilowatts of clean power to local homes and businesses, with more to come in 2021. At the same time, our community composting project kept over 24,000 pounds of food waste from the landfill, equal to 90,000 pounds of greenhouse gas from the atmosphere. This year, we started preserving peatlands, which cover only 3% of the earth, but hold twice the carbon of all the world's forests. In just one year, our work reduced carbon emissions by 278 tons. Download the action kit we made for you and learn how to implement local climate solutions where you live. My favorite part is the chickadee at the end. Um, <laughs> that's kind of where we came from. And now Tim is going to chat about our Solarized success story. Um, well, we can start at the very beginning um, where uh, a group of very motivated individuals came together uh, in the action studio. And that's where I came in late into uh, 2020 season and got involved within the uh, uh, request for quote pricing group and kind of learned how the whole Solarize campaign were run. And uh, over the last two years, we've had very success successful two years of running with uh, over, I like to say 0.862 megawatts of solar installed. And, <laughs> a lot, yeah. and uh, we are also the highlight of last year, 2021, was the inclusion of Seward, uh, which is their own independent electrical utility of adopting of net metering. And, huge. Yeah, very huge. Yeah, it's uh, crazy. Filled with issues and problems, <laughs> but uh, the city, uh, the uh, city members and the city uh, residents were very, very involved and uh, was extremely successful with over 18 homes and, and two businesses solarizing and more coming this year. We were able to get within the cooperative buying, we were able to uh, bring in uh, individual solar installer companies to handle just a uh, focus on one community at a time. And so, for instance, last year we had one uh, company doing Homer, one company doing the Central Peninsula, and one company that did Seward. And everything was done pretty much on time and 
and um, everybody happy. No complaints, no problems again for the food. Huge jazz hands for yeah, Tim. It's a to, ton to coordinate it. He did it across the peninsula, which is a pretty impressive feat. And it's only done with other volunteers. And a uh, uh, big shout out to JP and Seward and, mm -hmm. and uh, uh, Yvonne out down in Homer, who really led their local areas into to making it happen. Uh, the community purchasing uh, solution or campaign uh, turned out not to be viable for the 2022 season. Uh, issues based on uh, 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 less returns, uh, less people interested in doing it. Um, the ability to get enough people in a single area to make it worthwhile for the uh, solar vendors to give suitable discounts. And then also the supply chain uh, problems that have plagued everyone everywhere, including the solar industry, made it very difficult for solar vendors to um, guarantee kind of anything, they, you know, as far as there is no guarantees for equipment anywhere. So they're having the same problems everybody else is as well. So this year we've tried to turn to focus to small businesses and uh, farms and in specifically in uh, trying to find financing and uh, help them get through the arduous task of <laughs> uh, dealing with the federal government and uh, the, the Rural Energy for American, uh, America program. Um, it's a fairly extensive uh, effort. Uh, normally, uh, they say um, on the website that it'll take up to two weeks just to get the paperwork together and to get it submitted. And so we're trying to create a step-by-step -step procedure and a checkbox basically uh, to uh, make this easier for individuals uh, that normally don't have the kind of resources that larger farms and larger businesses have. And that we will be uh, able to facilitate them getting their applications in correctly uh, the first time and, and uh, up for um, consideration. So in doing so, uh, <laughs> we've uh, started exploring what we can provide as a, as a business center um, and helping them out. Uh, primarily, one of the things we can do is a collective workshops where people can come in and work with us. We have the internet, we have uh, business equipment, uh, scanners, all uh, other printers, et cetera, for people to work with and able to get them uh, hopefully started in on their paperwork. We've also started compiling a checklist of all of the requirements that people are uh, required to do and if they're eligible uh, to do that. We've uh, worked on several uh, avenues of how you can immediately find out if you're eligible for a REAP grant. And uh, on the screen, you can see just a few of the small or the few immediate uh, uh, necessaries for to do it. So yeah, it's easy ish, easy -ish. Um, and <laughs> and it does require a lot of a lot of work. And so we know that farmers are very busy people, and so that's maybe one of the things that we can offer is sort of kind of getting all the ducks in a row and all the numbers. Um, I think as this slide shows, um, typically everyone in the state of Alaska except that if you live in the in municipality Anchorage. of Anchorage, yeah. you're going to be considered rural. And so um, it's also available to any small business. So I, I think, you know, we really want to focus on reducing the energy costs to food and agricultural producers and businesses in the state of Alaska, because we care a lot about food security and low energy costs. And so we like, we really like that combo. Um, our goal is to help five farms, um, and, and even if the help is, is small, if you've got it covered, then that's awesome. Um, but if we can help, we would love to. Here are the other seven easy-ish steps <laughs> <laughs> that are required to get that money. Um, but it is pretty awesome. It, I mean, it, it not just solar panels, but just so many things, Tim, right. like- um, Well, there's, it's, Again, it's a, each one of these steps is basically a project within itself, and there's a series <laughs> of requirements that you have to go through. And so uh, by doing it within a, uh, defi defining it into eight steps, it helps 
helps us be able to walk through and so that we're not overwhelmed by the entirety of it in a general. It's how do you eat an elephant? It's one bite at a time. <laughs> one bite at a time, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah, the first step, well, the first step after you figure out that you're qualified is getting your DUNS number and that in and of itself can be a long process. Um, yeah, and then just navigating the grant portal um, with the USDA. How oh, do you want to talk about energy? Um, the energy audit aspect of it is everybody that applies for an application has to have, uh, once you have your project designed uh, and, and in mind, you have to have an energy auditor uh, come out and uh, review your project, review your existing uh, environment mm -hmm. and um, so that they can um, show where, uh, you can show where you're going to make the improvements, where the money is going to be spent. Yeah. And so they, that's one of the other aspects that we're working on is lining up auditors. Um, there's very few in our area right now. And so we're working on the audit, audit aspect as well to help bring it in because that is one of the costs that the REAP grant does not cover. This is out of pocket uh, cost and their uh, energy audits are done various ways in different areas. And we're hoping to get, get it set up so that eligible uh, small businesses and farms are going to be able to get it, uh, an affordable energy audit. Mm -hmm. They're around $400. Yeah, four or $500. Mm -hmm. Four or five. Yeah, yeah. Um, and they can be reimbursed? Uh, no, the, the energy audit is not covered under the- Oh, that's uh, what Ben is hunting for though. Right. Yeah, yeah we're, I, we're always hunting for new angles and <laughs> ways to make things affordable. Yeah. So more well, on that and, soon. Yeah, and just on the aspect of that is that the same REAP program also provides grants to electrical providers to pay the salaries of individuals to do energy audits. So yeah, we're so exploring those different avenues. <laughs> and again, this is a very deep well that we, we stepped Swimming into. Swimming in. Yes, and, yeah. uh, but it's actually coming together very good. Um, I'm a retired IT specialist and uh, project manager. I've worked with federal governments, municipalities, pharmaceutical organizations. And like everything else, it it's, uh, seems overwhelming at first, but when you break it down, Step by step, it, it actually becomes uh, it actually becomes very manageable and doable. And um, uh, good organizational skills um, can either be uh, brought forward with you, or we can help you with those uh, organization to make sure that you keep all of your paperwork in line and and have everything ready for uh, the REAP application process. Yeah, and even if you're not in the Central Peninsula area, um, you know, we can be your help desk remotely um, and just, you know, even connect you to resources in your area. This is a great, great, a great opportunity, I think. Um, here's some of our contact info, but I did want to like transition us to the conversation and Q&A part of this presentation. And really, we want to know how can we help you? Uh, I saw a couple of folks, um, Austin and Lisa Marie and Janelle and Judy are interested in solarizing their farms. I know um, Austin, uh, you guys have a homestead. Um, where is your homestead? Feel free to list it in the chat or, or say it out loud. And then Janelle and Judy, you guys are in Kodiak. Um, you know, certainly that's, you know, we're all neighbors here in Alaska. It's one big, small town. So yeah, we're, we'd love to help anyone who's interested, or if you know of other, other farms or other small businesses that are food related, especially that might be interested in this, we would drop your email in the chat and we'd, we'd love to just kind of get this ball rolling, but how could we be of best help to you? And I'm just going to reiterate as far as being in a central or, you know, um, one big state because all REAP applications go through a single person in Palmer. Ms. Misty Hull is our current uh, REAP administrator in uh, Department of Agriculture in Palmer area. Very helpful person. I've been on the phone and emailed with her a couple of times now and extremely helpful. Yeah. I, I see a couple of folks, uh, Leonardo and Tia, are interested in um, their small business and greenhouse and home office. Um, we're going to ask the REAP coordinator right. about the home office situation because there's so many of us across Alaska who have home offices. And I think we just have to figure out like what percentage is covered. How do you order an energy audit? Well, you have to find an auditor first. Yeah. <laughs> we'll but seriously, they are. Uh, there mm -hmm. is a couple of do it. We're going to be compiling a list of the auditors, but they are uh, uh, out there. 
Um, you can find them uh, basically just search for energy audit and they have to be certified and, and registered. And it's always good to verify uh, that they are, uh, that their work is accepted. Yeah, uh, so Leonardo, you're in the Nana. Um, we'll, we'll look and if you drop your email in the chat, we'll um, see if we find anyone and we'll send them over. And I would have a question on the greenhouses is what kind of uh, renewable energy process or what are you looking to improve there? Because not only does the REAP program cover uh, energy generation, it also includes energy efficiencies and also equipment, mm -hmm. uh, uh, and, uh, more efficient equipment. So that would be, you know, and that's one of the first steps that we do within the REAP process is you have to have a plan. You have to know what you want to achieve and you have to have very defined and doable uh, goals. Yeah, I don't think your system has to be grid tied in order nope. to qualify for the REAP grant at it all. It does not, nope. In greenhouses, is it normally for just electrical generation or are you looking for heat? Um, do you heat your soil? Do you heat your air? Yeah, the audit can be very helpful with that. Right. Um, we all have ideas, but the auditors are really um, experts in like how to make the most for your money. Um, so potentially they'll they'll after like a suite of solutions. Can we help define the plans? I mm. would say that that would be uh we can discuss how to define a, a well-defined plan and uh, i always like the uh the smart acronym <laughs> keep you it know, simple <laughs> yeah yeah well it's just it oh, you, it specific. has to be doable yeah. it has to be specific it has to be defined and it has to be completable yeah yeah when, i do think we have there also is a list of um frequently implemented projects all right, so we're looking at the heat for sure and winter lighting. Winter lighting is a difficult situation. Solar doesn't work really well here um, from October to March. Uh, March right now, I don't know if you've noticed it, everybody enjoying the sunshine we've been having lately, but uh, March is when we really first start generating electricity solar wise. So what the uh, solar installs can do is give you uh, credits during the summer months, spring and summer months, uh, that any of the excess that you use will give you credits towards your winter usage. Yeah. Um, the other, sorry, a caveat with like Alaska doesn't have good solar um, is that for a lot of our barns and uh, like for the greenhouse, especially the greenhouse that Tia is talking about, which is right on the bluff in Kenai, um, it does have like a, a really tall vertical area. And depending on the construction of that greenhouse, um, there's some ways that you can attach panels vertically yes, um, and then tilt them slightly so that they capture the maximum winter solar gain. And that can act, especially for a system where you're getting $20,000, you can afford to put some of those type of types of panels on our bigger like food producing structures. Also, uh, University uh, Fairbanks, University of Alaska and Fairbanks released their report on bifacial panels um, I forget what area they were in. Uh, I think it was right outside of Fairbanks, but they did a whole study on using the bifacial panels, which allow sunlight to pass through and then generates on the backside. So what's happening within the agricultural industry down in the lower 48 that instead of building a shadow over their land, uh, you're actually able to plant underneath the solar panels that it allows the lights through. Of course, you know, your crops are going to be dependent upon the amount of lights that you get. But again, this is the type of, uh, of planning that you want to look at as far as uh, your ultimate goals. And again, the, uh, one of the aspects about solar is that it's a long term investment. You're talking 25 years of investment into your uh, farms. Uh, so, you know, you want to not only make sure that you get it right the first time, but also that it's expandable. One of the things that uh, has been fortunate uh, this last year, and thanks to Senator Murkowski, um, is the continuation of the tax credits and the incentives, incentives that are moving forward every year. So every year we get it. So for instance, if you get a tax credit last year, you buy a complete solar system. And then now this year you wanna put in a solar uh, wall or a, a power wall. 
so that you can be powered off, uh, off grid. That is also covered this year. So any new uh, ask, uh, purchases that you make towards uh, energy uh, generation and or efficiency falls within, uh, is eligible for the same tax credits. Uh, and we'll kind of just throw out some numbers for you here because we've had some successes with the REAP program. We've seen some people that have done it in the past and that the REAP program can save in combination with tax incentives can save you up to 44% of the initial cost of the system. And for businesses and uh, uh, small farms, uh, you're looking at a much shorter return on investment than uh, the say the standard residential homeowner. One of the things that farmers do and small businesses is that they use their electricity every day. And that's the best way to use solar power is to use it yourself immediately as you're generating. And that is uh, kind of one of the unforeseen savings that you get, but it definitely reduces your electrical bill. And then of course, any excess generation through Homer Electric at least is, uh, uh, um, credited back to your account, dollar mm -hmm. for dollar for the to carry over to the next month. Heidi has been an excellent room moderator. We've got five minutes left <laughs> and we um, there's some terrific conversations happening in the chat. And I do think, um, Heidi, will you be able to share the chat back with at least me and then others? Um, ju just because we've I got yeah, there's um, both uh, Janelle and Judy and um, um, Lisa Marie, um, who were neighbors. Sorry, <laughs> sorry, I didn't recognize you. Um, there, there have some specific desires already for the system that they might want to implement with this grant, and I think that's really fabulous. Thanks for sharing your email. One um, of the, and there's the, if I may, real oh, quick, yeah. as you're thinking about the projects that you're looking for, and especially when it comes to heat. Uh, you might want to uh, start researching heat pumps. Um, it's the, mm -hmm. uh, in the South, they call them swamp coolers, but it's a uh, much more energy efficient way to heat areas. Um, and it uses, uh, not to get too technical, but it uses the delta change in air and combination to do it. So you're, uh, uh, the systems are limited to the environment that they work in. It can only heat so much, uh, but it also cools as well too. So uh, hot houses here can get very warm. <laughs> mm -hmm. So, you know, you, you can want to do that. So uh, you might want to look into thermal heat pumping as a uh, 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 possible solution to your heating needs. Yeah. Yeah, it is sort of a black hole, but the USDA site for this grant is a good place to poke around if you're at all interested. Um, and when the, we're going to have a workshop on the 24th right, specifically Thursdays. about this. So ooh, we should give them the details uh, <laughs> of the workshop. So okay. Tim is going to be leading a, a deep dive for anyone who's seriously interested in, in applying for this grant. Right. We, what we're doing is kind of doing an open house workshop. We're trying to do it in a um, uh, various fashions, both online and in person, so that uh, people that have want to get started, want to start doing the deep dive, we're setting up a workshop where we can work together and um, delve deep into it and uh, hopefully answer numerous people's questions all at the same time. Um, we hold the workshops from 4 to 7 p.m. It's an open entry, open exit. Um, and it's very informal. It's, uh, again, we're just trying to, our biggest uh, efforts right now is information gathering and not only the technical information concerning the reef, but the all of the needs of the uh, farmers and small businesses as well. Yeah, um, and you will have a, we'll put up the link on the right. Solarize website. Right. It and may not be up there now, but right. we'll have it up soon. Right. And I, one of the last things to mention concerning the REAP program is it also deals with processing equipment as well too. For you home uh, businesses that uh, honey, for instance, um, Berries, uh, you know, the, the REAP grant does cover the acquisition of uh, uh, processing equipment as well. Any other questions that we need to have an answer? Thank you so much. I think we are about at time, Caitlin and Tim. A uh, really interesting presentation. Uh, thank you for that.
Next up, we've got Eat Local Food, Nourish Our Community, uh, Kine Local, we're from Kine Local Food Connections Community Projects. And we've got Willow King, Jeanette Pedginski, and Alasha Brito presenting. So what do we do now? So, let's see, I'll remove the spot. Oops, sorry. Megan already spotlighted. So if you would I'll like to stop, stop sharing there. my screen. Yep. Yep, there you go. Thank you. <laughs> oh, got our picture. <laughs> <laughs> Look at that. Some other good people here. Hi, Willow. All right. Just, uh, hello, thank you for, that was an awesome presentation, Caitlin and Tim, that was awesome. Thank you so much for that. Um, all right, so we'll jump into it. So um, we're Kine Local Food Connection and um, I, myself and uh, Willow and Jeanette will be discussing uh, the community programs that we have going on and some that we're working on for the future. Um, just a brief introduction. My name is Alicia Brito. I've been a member of Kenai Local Food Connection for eight or nine years. It's been a long time now. Um, I am a commercial fisherman in the Bristol Bay. I um, really love local food and have a large garden and have a real passion for food and, and community around food. Um, Willow, do you want to jump in? Sure. Hi, uh, my name is Willow King. I'm a big local foods enthusiast. Uh, I've been participating and collaborating with Kenai Local Foods for about six or seven years-ish. Uh, I'm a small business owner and work, I'm on the board of Cook Inlet Keeper, just kind of, you know, a hot rack, just like everybody else here. And I'm um, excited to be here today talking about this fun stuff. Jeanette? So my name is Jeanette Pajinski and I'm a lifelong Alaskan. I've raised four kids eating a lot of locally grown and wild foods in Alaska and um, grew up with a homesteading lifestyle. So my passion is sustainability and local foods and community action to help everybody else do the things I'm passionate about too. Go ahead, Alicia. All right. So Kina Local Food Connection is a group of community members from all different walks of life. And we're interested in locally grown, raised, hunted, and um, gathered foods. We are completely, at this time, completely volunteer run. Um, and we are, our tagline is eat local foods and nourish our community. And our mission is really to forge connections within our community to increase access to local foods and knowledge about healthy eating. Um, we are located in the Central Peninsula, and um, we have uh, done many, many projects over, over the past however many years we've been around. It's been a long time, and, um, and uh, we'll just kind of start going through some of those and tell, telling you about what we have going on. We have several other group members in the audience here, um, and so I just like to give a shout out. I see Eliza Eller. She's another um, another she's waving at us and also tia holly i see tia holly here as well and she's also another member of our group um and i don't i thought i saw heidi che earlier she's also uh, been a member of our group for a long time so all right um the first project i want to talk about is our local food directory um, this project started in 2011 and it started out as just a black and white one pager print off the computer listing of, of local food that we had in the central Kenai. Um, in 2016, we redesigned it to be this trifold brochure design that we have shown up here on the screen. Um, it's, you know, the, the look of it has changed over the years, but it's been a trifold design since 2016. Every year we open up applications for, for businesses that want to be a part of this directory. Um, sometime around February, and then we we get the once we have all of those in, we get the design done and and get them printed and ready to go before the market season. Um, we 
this this project has been um, really great and then it's started to kind of be self-supporting. We have a fee structure to be included in the directory. Uh, we start from a really base fee of $30 for a standard business listing. And that talks about the products that you sell, where and when you sell them, and then contact information for your business. And then it kind of goes up from there. We have an enhanced business listing for 40. We have a, a directory sponsorship where your logo will be included, and that's $200. Um, and then we've got, we, we even have some other levels above there, uh, one of which includes um, promotion at our Harvest Moon local food events. Um, and you can find all that information on our website. We'll, Get you the URL for that at the end here. The fees that we that we take pay for the design, the layout, printing, and the distribution. And we distribute these in libraries, visitors centers, grocery stores, medical offices, markets, tribal offices, feed stores, um, bookstores, and restaurants. And um, we really love this project. We know the community loves it and looks for it every year. And we're really hoping to, to kind of grow bigger with this at some point. We're a big group of dreamers. We always are looking for new and, and better things to do. And we've kicked around ideas about a, a really easy to use website, maybe an app someday. So we're definitely looking to expand this in the future. Um, the next community project that we've been doing um, for a long time now is uh, Harvest Moon. This event has been held annually since 2013. We did take a quick pause in 2020, but it's really morphed and changed over the years. Um, it started out as just a, a talk with a movie and, and a community dinner. And over the years, it branched out to include cooking classes, movies, farm to table suppers, farm tours, speakers, berry walks, wild edibles walks. And sometimes it was a few days or a week long with different events. But in 2018, we shifted to this kind of massive all-day event you know, located in Soldotna at Soldotna Creek Park. And this event now includes booths for farmers, uh, information booths, food trucks with local specials, local food specials, live music, uh, even a pie contest that's sponsored by the Kenai Peninsula chapter of Alaska Farm Bureau, in which you're required to, to use some local ingredients in your pie. Um, Kina Local Food Connection itself hosts a uh, children's activity area with fun coloring um, and, and activities all based around local food for kids. It's, uh, we also have an information booth where we sell some books related to local food and healthy eating. Um, we have a demonstration booth that includes things like um, cooking, but also preserving of food. And we have our, what I consider now our famous fermentation station. And uh, that fermentation station is a place where you can buy vegetables at the local farmer's booths, bring them to our fermentation station, and then we help you create jars of, of fermented vegetables. And um, the jars and, and the salt and the, the information is free. You just have to buy the vegetables and, and bring them. Um, I'm gonna show a quick, quick video here um, to, that's about just a, a quick thing about our, um, our festival. So you can see that. Alasha, I think your video stopped. Oh no, I'm sorry. Just a second. Sorry about that. No worries. Also, if you want to move your little boxes to the Were side. Were you seeing them? No, oh, sorry yeah. about that, guys. No, cool. I'm on a different there. laptop than <laughs> normal. And yes, technical difficulties. Okay, let me. Sorry about this. No worries. Okay. Edit all these. 
Okay, let's try this again. Is that better? Here we go. So that's just a, a little picture of, of what um, Harvest Moon looks like for us. Jeanette, if you wanna jump in here. Sure, the Harvest Moon Festival is the first major project I got involved in with Kenai Local Food Connection. And it was just an awesome feeling to be part of something bigger than myself that was doing such good work in the community. So it happens on September 10th this fall and just want to encourage everybody that can to come on down. As you can see from the videos, we have perfect weather that day. We always have for the years that we've had it. And um, I just wanna give a shout out here to the Rasmussen Foundation um, and our awesome grant writer, Eliza Eller and others. Um, but we were able to purchase a 16 foot cargo trailer that is basically a festival in a box. It holds all our tents, tables, chairs, tablecloths, jars for fermentation, all of our equipment, our sandwich board signs. And, and so that was a really big boost from the, uh, the Rasmussen Foundation. The thing about the festival is just um, so much fun. And you could see the live music there. And we've had a juggler who loves to come back each year and he doesn't only entertain, he teaches. So it's just so much fun and as well as education regarding um, farming practices, food, all sorts of things that keep us sustainable and healthy. So um, usually it's about 3000 people through the course of the day and it's a family event. There's no beer garden and people have mentioned that, that they're, they're happy about that. And it's a lot of local people, you see your friends and, and um, although we did have a tour bus call us the night before the festival last year and say, um, is there parking for a tour bus there? So the, the word gets out and it's a wonderful event and just a lot of positive community energy. It takes lots of planning, lots of volunteers, uh, lots of budgeting work and on the computer. Um, and part of, part of the success is we have wonderful volunteers that are willing to reach out to the community and ask for the, ask for the donations and ask for the other things that, everything that takes to make it successful. Um, another part of Kenai Local Food Connection, it, it's connecting um, positive people, positive energy. And we have a lot of skills involved with the individuals that are part of the group. Um, there's, alicia has got really good, you can go ahead and blush Alicia, because <laughs> you are just a wizard with technology and all the good stuff that, that makes a good website happen. And so with the website, it makes a, a good presence and she does it all for free, just tons and tons of volunteer hours. So one thing we do to maintain our connection is have um, farm and food Fridays. So that happens once a month, used to be at a restaurant, uh, different restaurants, and now we do it by Zoom, although we've been invited back to the restaurants. It happened because we had a, a screening of the film called Farmers for America, and we had some guest speakers and, and a panel discussion after the film, and. People just wanted to keep the discussion going. So now we have these monthly meetings and we've had speakers come. Each meeting we start out and everyone introduces themselves and tells what their business or their relationship with food and farming is. And so it's just good networking. People get to know each other and there's always people hanging around after the meetings to talk and continue the conversation. So we've had garden club, farm bureau, 
um, cooperative extension borough employees. Um, in April, we are going to be having Tim Dillon from the Kenai Peninsula Economic Development District speak. And that's, um, yeah, we, we took a little pause, but we're, we're back and going strong. We take a break during the summer and just do these things through the winter. And there's really wonderful for those of us that like to talk and we're really social and it keeps us connected. So another thing we do for the uh, Kenai Local Food Connection um, project is the double up coupons. And people, I'm sure mostly are familiar with the concept of doubling WIC coupons and senior farmers market coupons. Um, so that was a project that got started because of some money that came in through COVID funding. And so we partnered with the food bank. They, they basically run the program now and reimburse the farmers and the vendors for their coupons that get turned in. And so um, it's an ongoing project. We've done it for two years. The second year was not quite as successful as the first year. And so with like every project, we, we do an evaluation and figure out the strengths and weaknesses, that good old SWOT analysis and threats and opportunities. And so um, we, the brainstorming in networking connection and connecting is an important part to solve problems. And a lot of the projects we do are just, they come up organically. And every few years we have a major um, visioning session and, and it's always good ideas and just really positive. So I'm gonna pass it on to um, Willow now and she can talk about a project that she's been very involved with. Um, the, I just wanna say that when the COVID pandemic funds were available through the city of Sodlatna, we were awarded several thousand dollars to provide stay healthy food boxes because we had previously coordinated another food, bo food box program. And so Willow is a very instrumental part of that. And go ahead, Willow, take it away. Thanks. Um, so I have collaborated with Kenai Local Foods Connection off and on for quite a while, as I mentioned earlier. Um, the name of my business for the past long while has been where it's at, Mindful Food and Drink. Um, in the last year, I have collaborated more and more heavily with Anastasia Scolland, who is the owner of the Good Sustainable Grocery. Now we have taken our two businesses, put them under one umbrella LLC called Mindful Living Collective. Um, just a little background there. And uh, during this period of collaboration in the last, since coronavirus really, um, we have had the really awesome opportunity to have some funding available to provide uh, a period of total of 20 weeks and a one of one of one of them was an eight week program for 34 families and one was a 12 week program for 24 families um, and so just a really neat opportunity to play around with making sure that people who are live at risk or struggling have the opportunity to eat quality foods and uh, learn what to do with them, just like improving accessibility to local and organic foods and whatnot. So um, anyhow, uh, it was a weekly pickup and the families would come, they would buy in each week with a cost of $15 for a $100 value-ish box. And each Stay Healthy Food box contained a hot soup, fresh local bread, pickled veggies and or ferments, a veggie fruit box that we do, which usually has at least 11 different kinds of fresh produce in it. And um, also dry goods for, in the last round, we started to adjust the amount of dry goods based on the family size, which was a nice change. Um, since some of our families had eight or nine people and some of them had two people who were pregnant, um, we had to we just been kind of like shifting around as we moved through this pilot period. So anyhow, we, <clears throat> I've estimated that we moved probably close to 3,000 pounds of dry goods and I forget, closer to two tons or more of local and organic veggies. Um, one of the bases of our 
kind of agreement with these programs was that we would definitely prioritize Alaska grown first. So uh, close to half of those dry goods that we sent out were from Alaska Flower Company. So we gave the entire range of Alaska barley products as well as other legumes, grains, rices, beans, quinoa, lentils, everything. Um, so, and then the cool thing about this program, it wasn't just the giving of the food to the families, but we also provided high quality kitchen equipment and educational materials every week. So um, we had, we identified that like some of the most used kitchen equipment that we have is generally our cast iron skillets and our stainless steel pressure cookers. We also did some quality knives, cutting boards, wooden utensils, um, that sort of thing throughout the two rounds. Um, and then the educational materials were generated by, we generated a weekly newsletter, which always had some tips and like a new recipe that corresponded with whatever we had in the box that week that we thought maybe people might need a little help with. And then we also made really great use of the collaborative, ex collaborative, cooperative extension uh, educational, you know, they have a library where you're just like going through and you're like, okay, today's quinoa and kale, here's cucumbers and kohlrabi, um, that sort of thing. So anyhow, it really neat opportunity to engage with the public and bring, you know, more knowledge and understanding of how to like what local foods and whole foods look like and how to deal with them and a lot of like support and communication back and forth has been a really the cool part of this program. Um, we actually are trying to use, so, okay, sorry. So Mindful Living Collective sets aside 1% of our sales to stay healthy food boxes so that we can kind of match any future funding that we might be able to find. We are also looking at local entities, um, mental health. You know, we've been looking at some cancer prevention um, discussions about how to make these, these things more accessible to our communities. Um, and so if anyone has any thoughts or ideas surrounding that, the, the cool thing about collaborating with other local entities who can recognize at-risk community members is that they can help generate the list of people who would be participating, um, which will kind of streamline the process because right now we're just kind of putting it out to our audience, which is relatively small, greater scheme of things. So that's pretty much the, the deal about Stay Healthy Food Boxes and um, the Mindful Living Collective. Here's just like a values set of ours. And so we've been working really hard for the last year to put together this like business plan and like implementation of this value set into an LLC operating mode. Um, so we are just really looking at all different ways to engage with local producers, farmers, artists, makers, entrepreneurs. Um, we pay our employees in both money and in-store credit. We are opening a grocery store here in Soldatna. You can see our upper beautiful beams here. We've grown out of the Cook Inlet Keeper Community Action Studio and are now in the old location of the Caribou Family Restaurant, which is close to 5,000 square feet of <clears throat> pure awesome. So here's some of our services. You know, we have um, pretty much local and organic produce, all a, a very broad array of dry goods, refillable soaps and body products, bath beauty, whimsy, all the things. And then um, we just, we want to make like the real, like the necessities of life. We want to help do the work for you so that you're not like, ah, I'm in a hurry. I have to buy a plastic toothbrush today because I'm going somewhere. So kind of looking at a one-stop shop, accessible situation for our community that we could build as a template so we can help other people do the same thing. So that's pretty much what I've got going on up here. And I just am so grateful for Kenai Local Food Connection because they are the movers and shakers that are a force to be reckoned with. I'm gonna go back to you, Alicia. Hey. Thank you. Yeah, and um, I'm we're running a little short on time and I wanna make sure that we can get through um, a video trailer that we have to share with you. So I'm just gonna really quick, um, we, we like, we have some upcoming, 
um, projects where we're partnering with the Cook Inlet Keeper on their composting project. It's a picture of compost being shuffled around there um, in the in the winter. And we're also um, we're also like to amplify other projects happening in our community. Jeanette, do you want to talk really quick about the the Soldatna Seed Library? Sure. It, it's because of our connection out in the community that um, we found Laura Hagland and she was just back in the woods and wanting, thinking about, you know, growing a few things and Stellaria Trial Garden is the name of her very scientific farming operation. And she said, I really want to have a seed library. That was a couple of years ago. So now the seed library happens and it's in Soldatna Public Library and it's a wonderful project that we are going to support. I saw there was a question in the chat about funding, I think for the food boxes. And I just wanted to mention that through the CARES grant, uh, COVID funds, Alaska Community Foundation, some of the funding came through that. And then there is funding also through the another uh, COVID grant that came through the city of Soldotna. So it's, it's the connections that we have that make these things happen. Yeah. And, um... That just brings me to this big thank you. We, we can't do this without our community partners that put in volunteer time at our events or financial donations or um, you know just sharing their, their talents and time with us. Um, we have a, a lot of people to thank for that. And um, right now we're kind of in a, in a time of transition where we're realizing it might be time to, um, to hire some staff. And so we're, we're starting to look for some funding for that and really excited about what the, what the future holds for us there. And um, having said that, you know, please connect with us. That's what we love to do. Um, we love to connect. If you've got a project going on or you're a farmer, um, please connect with us. You can find us at kinalocalfood.org um, and, or shoot us an email at kinalocalfood at gmail.com. And um, yeah, that's, that's what we're here for. And with that, I, we, we have a special project that we've been talking about for a number of years, and we wanted to create a film to really show um, the producers in the Central Peninsula area um, to the world and kind of what our farmers look like. And so we're really excited to hear quickly at the end of this presentation to show you um, a, a preview of this, this film. And um, I hope that uh, that you like it. And we are kind of shopping around for a name. So if anyone has a great idea for, for a name for this film, please let us know. So I'll go ahead and share that now. Um, we live in Kasilov, Alaska, on a little family farm. We're both city people, never even had any pets. <laughs> now we have like hundreds of pets. When we first came here, there were nothing here. And we just started building the soil, then build high tunnels, and grew our own vegetables and our own meat. Did they get over there? Yeah. They didn't How did get they in get there. in there? Walk over? John had that gate down to run the hose in. Oh. Only lost about five this time. Oh, that's better than 60% um, yeah. of the crop. <laughs> when we started, this ground looked exactly like the woods. It was tundra. Are you getting a good harvest? And the kids learn a lot too. Yeah. A so lot. Less uh, PlayStation and more shovel. <laughs> <laughs> so our schedule has seven and a half hours of farm work every day. It's not always enjoyable and it's often tiring, but when you see the results of all the work at the end of the year, it's really rewarding.
When was the last time you had an apple from Alaska? My name is Glenn Sackett, and I'm an organic farmer from Sterling, Alaska. It's Abby Lancashire Alla. My favorite vegetable is potatoes. My favorite vegetable is a tomato. So this greenhouse is all harvested. My dad started farming in 1948. I was his partner since I was 11 years old. I've been a beekeeper and an organic farmer since um, the early 70s. I'm dreaming big. I'm hoping for 4,000 pounds of tomatoes. And so I hope to be king of tomatoes. Okay. I have rabbits coming in here eating my peas. Farmer problems. You know, farming in Alaska has its challenges. The soil in there is not so great. We haven't had two million years of decay going into our soil because we had a glacier sitting here. If you can fight the wildlife and the, the cold and... The weather is crazy. The drought and the, the torrential rain <laughs> and... And Alaska is packed into a real short season. And you can't plant in three foot of snow. Food security is a real issue for Alaskans. We don't have enough food in the shelves to last a week for the population of Alaska. We cannot trust always on the trucks, on the boats. Why do you want to go to Fred Meyer and buy some three week old produce for a higher price? At that point, you've lost a lot of nutrient value in your, in your food. There's no life left in it. The price of vegetables alone in the supermarket in Alaska, I think, spurs a lot of agriculture here. I think it's a real opportunity for, for people like me, people that want to farm up here. You don't think they'll get any bit bigger? We have to somehow convince the next generation that working as hard as I do for a small amount of money as I get, how do you like that? That that's a good thing. Uh, thank you so much for, for listening to our presentation and uh, please reach out to us if you have any questions. Thank you. Thank you all so much. Those were amazing videos and everything you're doing is just great, very inspiring. Um, next up, we've got hydroponics uh, with Melissa Sykes. Uh, let's see, Denise Lavoy, Abigail Pratt, Nathaniel Harshman and Daniela Ramos. And they're going to talk all about the hydroponic growth system um, and how it's a vehicle for sustainable community engagement. So, Melissa, you can go ahead and share your oh, screen. Wonderful. There we are. <laughs> okay. Well, um, thank you all for coming to our presentation. I am going to share my screen because we all have a presentation on what we've been working on. Um, okay. Okay. Um, I'm trying to get it to say yes. It's asking me if I can share the screen and I'm saying yes but I'm not sure what's happening. Um, all right, I'm gonna cancel that. I'm trying to share my screen. There we go. Is it coming? Not yet. Okay. I'm sorry, I'm a little confused. All right, so it's just telling me to cancel it. I thought I had this down. It's very strange. All right, so I'll try it again. I'll make you a co-host and see if that helps. Okay, thank you. I'm sorry. It's okay. I thought that was how it's supposed to work. It's just giving me the option to cancel it, which is very strange. 
is your, would you like me to see if your slides are in the folder? Or? They are, but we had made a few changes since we put it up there. So I'm gonna try one more time for sharing screen, please for, bear with us on this. Did you, were you able to make me a co-host? Would that work? I did make you a co-host. Well, that's very strange. Why won't it let you me share screen? Denise, well, do you have it up? Do you want to try uh, instead of me? Hold on. That's really weird. I've never had this problem before. So, oh, all right, here, I know what. All right, I think we got it. Here we go. And now we see it through the screen. Okay, so I need to go here. Are you seeing my, my yep. PowerPoint? Yep, to start at the right. beginning. Yep. Okay. So um, this is a team presentation. There's a number of folks who will be joining me, as you see on the screen. We have Denise Lavoy, who is our VISTA team leader here in Fairbanks. And we have three VISTAs who will be speaking about this project that we did this past fall and where we were making a huge number of hydroponic towers. Um, I work for the Fairbanks Soil and Water Conservation District, which is up here. And we work with a, a lot of um, interior residents on providing technical support and educational support um, about natural resources. We also out of our office do invasive species planning uh, and control and management. We do soil testing. We work on water quality projects, including stream bank restoration. And we have uh, in the past done forest management activities. When we have a forester on board, we don't currently. And we provide agriculture assistance to farmers. And then my position where we provide a lot of different programs in um, education for teachers, youth, as well as uh, workshops with national organ, uh, programs, and we run an after-school program up here in Fairmix. Um, I am the state coordinator for agriculture in the classroom, and we have been getting connected to hydroponics through Ag in the Classroom and working with a number of grants over the previous years to develop the um, hydroponic growing tower with the help of teachers and other collaborators. Um, we received a number of different grants and support for this project. Um, and we connected with the folks out at Chin Hot Springs at the beginning of all of the education projects that we were doing with hydroponics and began growing their model for a hydroponic tower, which um, two folks up there, it was Bernie Carl's initial idea. And then the gentleman you see there on the right was the one who actually developed the model that we used in our teacher workshops. And um, we did a number of outreach workshops for local teachers, as well as collaboration with the university. Um, they have a program called Upward Bound, and those kids up there at the university got very excited about sort of uh, adjusting the big giant tower into a little bit smaller version, and uh, they came up with not just a smaller tower, but a way of connecting it to a Raspberry Pi, and they were working on a number of STEM activities with their kids, and we brought that with to the teachers. So... Um, this is the what it looks like inside the hydroponic tower. There's a pump at the bottom and it, there's a, a tube that goes up to the top and it brings water down that grows over the elbows that feed the plants. And there's nutrients in the water base there. It's very, very simple model, easy to put together and very efficient at growing. Um, all of our work with it led to us dreaming even bigger. We decided to work with uh, another person who was starting a hydroponic farm and wrote a community foods project grant um, to the USDA. And part of that is not just working with a big, large hydroponic farm, but getting out into the community some of these small towers, um, doing workshops as well as um, 
working with Vista agencies on sharing the information about being able to grow your own food. So we took that idea of having a community project to help increase food security in, in interior because we currently don't have any large scale hydroponic farms. We're working on developing one as part of this grant. And we'd like to see what um, they have down in Anchorage happen up here in Fairbanks. And we're taking small steps towards that. And so one of the things that we've had as part of all of these steps along the way, developing our, our connections to hydroponics is assistance from VISTA. And VISTA is um, a wonderful project that has provided us with a, uh, volunteers helping us develop not only the ways of getting this out into the community, but helping us to write the grants that help to support this project. And we have had four full-time and two summer vistas helping us with a number of these projects. So I'm gonna hand it off to Denise and mute me. Denise, why don't you, I'm gonna let you come on in. Um, Denise, can you join in? I am here. Can you hear me? All right. So you tell me when you, why don't you talk a little bit more about Vista and tell me when you want me to advance the slides. Got it. Thanks, Mel. <laughs> um, so a little bit about uh, the um, City of Fairbanks AmeriCorps Vista project. Um, it's been administered through the city since 2018. Prior to that, it was administered at the borough um, the current cohort we have, which will be nine once we get to April, um, we are deployed at nine different nonprofit and governmental entities. Um, I mean, I know, I'm certain I missed hours, but in 2021, the VISTA cohort provided in excess of 12,000 hours of service to this community. Um, we helped to recruit other volunteers. We get them doing other projects, um, including um, growing these towers. I actually had someone from the community who helped us during our one of our builds. Um, and we have raised um, through grants and other, um, you know, sort of uh, efforts, just under $120,000 um, for our nine um, sites. So we are, yeah, I, I cannot tell you how proud I am to have three of my VISTAs here with me, okay? They work every day, every day, every day for this community. So I just wanted to say that. <laughs> okay, next slide. So in October of 2021, um, I had been talking with Mel about a bunch of other things, and we decided that um, it would be a good time to go to Soil and Water and see if we couldn't try and build a few of these um, grow towers and sort of get a feel for what it was like to actually put them together. Um, and so three of us, you're only seeing Mel and, and the then program manager at the time in the photo, but there were um, two others of us in the room and we got together and we just banged out several of them. Um, it was an all afternoon project. Um, it involved, uh, and now you can go to the next slide, many different power tools, <laughs> um, but they're not difficult. They are not difficult to operate. Um, and again, the next tower, I mean, the next slide um, in between the, the, power tools, it's just easy buckets of either two or um, five gallons. Um, I think probably the, the most challenging thing is um, the little elbows you can see on the bottom left. That's what holds the um, plant. And they have to be made on a jig and we only have one jig. So that sometimes can get to be um, a little tedious, but otherwise um, it, it actually goes pretty quickly. Um, okay, next slide. And so from that initial um, three hour or so session, um, 
the first hydroponic tower um, was put here in our office in City Hall. And now you can click the next slide. And we then um, made a date <laughs> with more of my VISTA members um, over two sessions. And we built an additional 12 towers. And I have to tell you, want to talk about production. So the next slide. Um, we were, there, there we are. <laughs> so the two on the left are at the Boys and Girls Club of Fairbanks. They were kind enough to host us because they have um, tons of space. And then Soil and Water um, helped us uh, finish it up at the end. You can see that on the right. Next slide. And more. I mean, we just, yeah, it was nonstop, but we were all involved. I think everyone from the cohort um, got in on one of those sessions. And then finally, Mel, the next slide. Um, we had a second tower put into the um, office here in the city of Fairbanks. And finally, the final slide for me, I think. Um, it has become really not only a hub um, and a magnet for everyone in City Hall. They all want to come and see it. Um, but I have, um, along with my vistas, harvested herbs and greens. I have made um, basil for several of my <laughs> new vistas. Um, and it's easy. And um, it, it just has actually blossomed. There are other um, agencies within um, the city that actually also want towers now. So with that, I am going to pass it off to um, Nathaniel Harshman, and he will give us his take on his time during the build. Hello, everybody. My name is Nathaniel Harshman, and I am the Reentry Coalition Vista for uh, the Fairbanks area. And so I was invited to do these grow towers and I wasn't quite sure what to expect. Uh, the last time I had been invited to do any type of growing, I actually ended up doing five years in federal prison because it was for cannabis. And so, you know, that was from my father. I, I trusted Denise, you know, I figured I'd, I'd see what this was all about. But, uh, you know, so I was a little hesitant, but I like Denise, so I figured I'd give it a shot. So my expectations based upon my previous history of, of working on cannabis farms and, and dirt and soil and trucking up hills and back and forth, I wasn't exactly sure what to expect entirely. Uh, when I got there, though, what I found was a very clean cut operation. Everyone knew exactly what they were doing. There was multiple stations assigned for each person to kind of make it more efficient. And so I was actually able to bring my 14 year old with me. Now, they weren't really the most excited about some type of labor or, or grow tower building, but they do actually love plants. And so there was a little bit of interest there and I was able to cultivate that. And so they came in, they helped out. They're more upbeat once they saw how easy of a function it was. You know, uh, when you first think of farms or grow towers or anything like that, you might think like you're gonna be sweating and breaking your back all day. This is nothing like that whatsoever. It's really just a cakewalk. If you do the initial setup and, and like Denise said, you know, you build your jigs and you have all the right tools, it, it goes like nothing else. So I also was able to see the grow towers after they were done uh, with my other child, my six-year-old. And he was able to harvest some of the basil from Denise's office at City Hall. And lo and behold, we ended up forgetting that bag of basil in my office and, and it, you know, wilted over a couple of days of, of being forgotten. But that, that's besides the point. It, it was there, it was available, and it was a beautiful setup. Uh, other than that, you know, uh, anyone out there that's looking at doing this, I would highly recommend it. Um, you know, it, like I said, it, it's, it's simple, it, it's efficient, and it's effective. And so for any of you out there, please ask questions, get to understand this a little bit better because I believe these grow towers could be put in quite a few extra offices here around town. All right, I think we need to pass it off to our next presenter, which is, who is Daniela? Or Danny. Yeah. Go ahead, Danny. So, hello, um, I'm Daniela. Um, I'm the Community Outreach Steward Vista at the Fairbanks Senior Center. Um, <laughs> so um, I actually really enjoyed being a part of 
the builds. I was really a part of the second round of builds that we did at um, the Sonoma Water Conservation District. Um, not only was it like really simple, um, I mean, it was, a, it was simple once I wrapped my head around it because it is like different technology, but like just dipping my toes in just helped me appreciate how simple like plants really are, you know? And like, I don't know, it feels intimidating um, in a world where like, you know, you just go to the grocery store and just like buy what you need. I, like I'm not, I feel like I'm not really used to being, also I, I used to live in a city. So like, I just like have never really been around any type of farming or anything as, as much as I've, I've wanted to get into um, gardening and stuff. But yeah, just being introduced to um, the grow towers and then being able to go harvest at City Hall and at our tower um, has just been, I mean, it's really amazing and I tell all my friends and I feel like just spreading the word um, is like a big part of this project. So I'm really excited that um, I, me personally, you know, that I was able to be a part of this. Um, as far as the senior center goes, um, I feel like the Grow Tower here has really introduced our center and our, not only like our employees, but um, the the center right now, it's, it's closed um, um, for, uh, visitors it used to be um, we, we we have a really big uh, meals on wheels program um, we run the only meals on wheels program in the interior of Alaska we serve over 440 seniors every single day and a lot of them used to have their meals in the senior center itself um, so unfortunately because of COVID we're still closed um, but you know we have volunteers that um, come in and uh, volunteer drivers for the Meals on Wheels um, meals. <laughs> um, and they see the Hedgeponic Tower and they're always like so interested and impressed. And I feel like it really does help spread the word um, of how simple it can be and, and how dedicated the um, community is to uh, sustainable growth and stuff. Um, I, I think it's built community in the workplace. Like I've a lot of people talk about how interesting it is i had somebody take a picture of it and you know send it to me and like edit it and make it really pretty um i had somebody else tell me that they need like really a really interesting recipe recipe with like some herb and some herbs that they picked so it, it really is like pulling this all together and um i also think that it um is just uh i guess like teaching people about how how, yeah, like involved the community is um, with a project like this. Um, and as I was saying with um, that the senior center is closed, uh, we're hoping to open at some point soon. <laughs> we don't know if it's gonna be this year or in the future, but we are hoping to open as soon as possible. And when we do, um, you know, those seniors will be back in here and, you know, those seniors can be then involved with uh, the hydroponic tower. We're hoping um to at the very least um just expand like i was saying with me like just introduce them to like a new technology and something that might inspire them to grow their own food at home which you know can be really helpful um considering that in alaska we have a big problem with senior isolation um you know growing your own plants it it can really help um when you're you know feeling isolated um but you know potentially we're thinking of maybe doing some type of activities like maybe um, a cooking group or um, having some speaker come in or something like that. We've done events like that in the past before COVID. Um, so we would definitely be open to doing something like that um, once we open with, you know, regarding the hydroponics tower. And I just feel like it's really creating a lot of opportunities um, within the center for, you know, new stuff for us to do. So I'm, I'm just really happy that, you know, the Fairbanks Senior Center is a part of this. And I think that, you know, a lot of other places around Fairbanks would really benefit from it. Okay. Um, so let's pass it along to Abby. And I'm going to change the slide. Abby, are you there? Yep. I can't see anything. All right. <laughs> Thanks, Danny. Okay. So I'm Abby. I am the Vista at Thrive Alaska. We can go to the next slide. 
Um, so Thrive Alaska is composed of various programs that directly provide either families with affordable, high quality child care and counseling or providing child care workers with resources to improve both the quality of their care and career. So I actually moved here in January to start my VISTA service term. So I wasn't a part of the original build sessions. So my first like hands-on exposure besides receiving um, basil and all that from the one that City Hall was setting up the Grow Tower at Pearl Creek, which is a before and after school um, care at an elementary school. And that was March 1st. And we were both really surprised at how easy it was, just some zip ties and also child friendly. So just moving some of the cords aside so that they're not a tripping hazard. And that was a really pleasant surprise that it, it, there weren't like nails on the floor. You could do it in, while the kids were in classes. So that was really nice. Then we got so excited about that one that we actually reached out and asked for another one for our Head Start site which is where we have zero to five-year-olds. So you can go to the next slide. So this one that we got is used and needed a cleaning before we could use it. And this took uh, Denise and I about an hour and a half, but it definitely taught us the importance of upkeep and keeping the algae from getting to a point of uh, where it's out of control and you need to take an hour and a half to just completely take it apart and clean it. But it also showed that um, it has an element of sustainability. So these shouldn't end up in a landfill. They can have multiple homes and they have opportunities of restoration. You can go to the next slide. So Thrive Alaska's response to this has been one of definite excitement. I've heard stuff like, stuff like this usually doesn't happen for us, which kind of mirrors our mission goal of providing high quality childcare for families who usually that doesn't happen for them. We're also excited about the nutrition it's gonna provide, education, and the kids at Pearl Creek, which are pictured right there, um, have already commented on how relaxing the water and the lights are. Importantly too, it demystifies produce for the children we serve and their families. So hopefully that should lead to a decrease in degenerative diseases for Fairbanks vulnerable communities and inspire the next generation of scientists. Thank you. All right. So um, thank you all for, for listening. And uh, we really enjoyed um, putting together this presentation and getting our VISTAs to join us on this project. Um, and we're looking forward to some more of our community outreach and working with the locations that we've put these towers. And because I mostly before all working with the VISTAs, I just had these at school. So it's really nice having them out in the community and getting that community involvement. So I'm going to stop sharing my screen and go back to here. Great. So um, and we can open it up for if you have any questions from folks. Um, I couldn't see the chat anytime I was in presentation mode, but if anybody has any specific questions, let me know. I don't think you missed any questions, but this is a great time to ask any. We've got about three minutes before the break. So feel free to put There's those a in the chat. There's a hand up. There is a hand up, yeah. Yeah, uh, this is uh, Charles Bingham with the Sicka Local Foods Network. And my question is, uh, you know, I, I'm familiar with the grow towers and all that, and I think they're good for, you know, smaller scale stuff like in school classrooms and everything. But, uh, what I'm looking for is I'm trying to write a grant for a larger year round growing project. You know, like where we, we maybe do hydroponics in an old warehouse or something like that. And so if anybody has info that I can use to start pulling budget info and and uh you know what do we need what you know because i'm not really a grower myself you know just you know you need these items you need um you need to have this much room you need this much electricity that kind of stuff 
If you could email that to Sika Local Foods Network at gmail.com, I'd appreciate it. I, I can I can share that with you, Charles. Uh, we do as part of this project, we are working with um, some folks who are setting up a larger scale hydroponic farm. So yes, that that is possible. The deal with the towers is that it's not overwhelming for people. You can have production and typically I can get a lettuce harvest out of my tower uh, from seeding it to harvest with yeah we're looking five, for five trying weeks. to do like community level rather than uh yep. small scale um and, no, and also that's with okay the, uh, charles i totally understand that it, and the with the towers idea. also i know uh, whenever lisa murkowski put hers in her office she said they ended up having to uh build kind of a buffer area around it because of the uh the sump pump was pretty loud and so it reduced the sound it was acted as a sound barrier and so that's something is, people might think about too. Charles, that's one of the reasons that they developed the smaller tower to, to for that very reason. It, the smaller tower has a smaller pump and it's not as loud. And, and you still get lots of production, right, Denise? Lots Absolutely. <laughs> I have mine on and I have two of them in my office. I have them on during the day. I do not run them at night. They're on a timer um, because they are actually so soothing and I love the light particularly in the winter up here, <laughs> um, that uh, honestly, um, I only will unplug them if I am on a Zoom call because then there's a little bit of, of um, sort of interference, but otherwise they are on all the time and they're just in the background. They're actually very yeah. easy to work with. And I saw a couple of different uh, questions about fertilizer. Um, we, we use a hydroponic fertilizer called uh, Dynagrow and it comes from our local uh, um, greenhouse and we support them by buying that from them. It is, there are ways of doing a hydroponic tower that are a little less chemical dependent, but for this one, we don't use miracle Grow. Um, Dynagrow is my, uh, my go-to and I, to, if you have specific questions about fertilizer, I'm more than happy to, to answer them. Um, it, it's, it's not a terrible thing to get. It's easy for us um, and you can order that, but we, we don't use miracle Grow if there was concerned about that. Um, there are different ways. In fact, we were working with a few folks on developing um, a type of fertilizer that's a bit like, um, Sourdough, where it produces the chemicals, uh, it produces the nutrients. It's a it's a microbe that produces the nutrients, but you put that in a different bin and it and it feeds through the system. And there are different ways to do fertilizer um, that are a little less reliant on chemical fertilizers. But for what I need, I just use the Dynagrow. As a practical matter, though, if part of this is also to empower um, individuals in the community to get in touch with their own food. I think sometimes we need to meet people where they are. And yep. as much as we are sort of gung ho on more natural approaches, um, you need to make it as easy as possible for people to do this in their own homes. So if it comes down to miracle Grow occasionally, okay. But honestly, no, I mean, that isn't necessarily the way I would want to go. Yeah. And there are lots and lots and lots of different types of hydroponics out there. This is just one we chose. No, I'm not advocating for one over the other. If you want to do hydroponics, try different things. You can do hydroponics in a juice container. You don't need fancy, fancy stuff for it. It doesn't have to get overwhelming. Um, and we do it in a fish tank in our office as well. Uh, include in addition to the tower. Um, so there are lots of methods out there that are perfectly fine and safe and easy to do. And on the Soil and Water Conservation District webpage for Fairbanks, we have all of the instructions for building that tower as well as the fish tank or using a storage tub. And we have videos that we worked with a local FFA group to put together on teaching you how to do it. So it's not just reading instructions. You can actually watch a video on how to put it together. There's lots of great uh, info out there. So um, again, 
we want to work with everybody. If, if, if they have questions, feel free to email me. I will share with you the all that we have. None of it, we don't charge for any of it because it's part of our project. So um, thanks again for attending and we really appreciate you guys. And sorry for going over a little bit, but we thanks for, for sticking around. Thank We're in you. a break really now. Interesting presentation. Thank you all. Thank there, you. It, there is a break until 3.30 now. And we'll be well, back. and I'm I'm we'll happy to answer more questions if anybody if people want to stick around. I don't know if you want yeah. to put up the, the wait slide, but um, I can see the. the I'll put up the break slide, and it'll be it'll be open. So feel free okay. to feel free to keep asking questions if you don't need a break. <laughs> All right. Well, I think I'm going to take a quick break. And thanks. Thanks all of you guys for presenting with us. Um, you guys did. You guys rocked. <laughs>